Citizens, I am so tired that I cannot even tell you the details of the Battle of Arcole. It was a fight to the death. The generals manifested unparalleled bravery. There was no one among them whose clothes would not be covered with blood. The Battle of Arcole made a huge impression on the entirety of Europe. For many people, it was gradually becoming obvious that the French Republic was winning this war. Nevertheless, the members of the Directory, who became tired of the war, decided to use a favorable moment at the Italian front and offer the Austrians a truce. For this purpose, the Directory sent General Clark to Vienna, who was to negotiate with the Austrians about the truce and further peaceful Congress. However, the Austrians still did not consider themselves defeated and therefore showed an absolute unwillingness to reach a compromise. The successes of Archduke Karl on the Rhine front still instilled confidence in the Austrians that they could overcome the French in this war. As a result, the Austrian government refused to accept General Clark in Vienna. The Austrians would only allow the truce negotiations if they were given the right to bring food and supplies for the garrison in Mantua without let or hindrance. Bonaparte was against these conditions. He categorically refused any truce that would not include a condition of Mantua capitulation. He was absolutely assured that the Austrians would only use this truce as an occasion to strengthen their army and continue their offensive. Bonaparte was persistent in convincing the Directory members that he had enough power to force the capitulation of Mantua and receive the final victory. However, General Clark, who arrived at Bonaparte's headquarters, had another opinion. After the Battle of Arcole, Bonaparte was in a state of extreme physical exhaustion. Such a condition of the Commander-in-Chief made General Clark doubt that the French army was going to succeed if the campaign continued. He is so exhausted that he is even incapable of mounting a horse without suffering, and he has become extremely skinny. His face is very pale and his appearance is sickly. Nevertheless, despite everything, Bonaparte did manage to convince the Directory that he could get the decisive victory. So, after the failed negotiations, the Austrians started active war preparations. Archduke Karl again sent new reinforcements to Albinci. Also, volunteer battalions were sent to Italy, as well as a part of Vienna's garrison. The Austrians mobilized all their reserves. Thanks to these urgent measures, Alvinci had 48,000 soldiers by January 1797 for a new offensive. In addition, the Austrians managed to win over the Pope again. Despite the truce that he had concluded with the French, Pope Pius VI also started mobilizing his troops to distract the French army's attention and, in this manner, support the offensive operation of the Austrians. Alvinci was in a great hurry because the supplies of Mantua nearly ran out and the garrison was in very poor condition. It was clear that the Austrians only had one last attempt left to save the garrison of the fortress. Meanwhile, despite difficulties, Bonaparte continued preparations for the upcoming battle. Having received several new brigades as reinforcement, he formed a new division headed by General Ray. Also, personal changes were made in the army. Old and incapable generals were removed from command and replaced by young and energetic officers. In total, Bonaparte had 47,000 soldiers. 10,000 of them were forced to block the troops of Wormser in Mantua. Also, realizing that a decisive battle was ahead, Bonaparte decided to call on the local population. It is time when Italy will take its place among great nations. Lombardy, Bologna, Modena, and Ferrara will one day amaze the entirety of Europe and will bring Italy's greatest days. To arms, Italians, let the tyrants and enemies of our freedom tremble. Thus, in early January 1797, Alvinci started his offensive operation with all his powers. The decisive battle for Italy began. On January 8th, Angerot's division was the first to get seriously assaulted on the front's eastern sector. The pressure from the Austrians was so powerful that Angerot retreated to Legnano and asked Bonaparte for help. 
Very soon, it became known that the enemy was also progressing toward Verona. This sector of the front was protected by Massena. Also on that day, Bonaparte received a message from Joubert that he was attacked in the Adige Valley. Thus, the French were attacked from three directions. Being in his headquarters in Verona, Bonaparte received reports every two hours from his generals and meticulously analyzed every sector of the front. The most important task was to define the main direction of Al Alvinci's attack. Inform me as soon as possible if you think that the enemy on your front has over 9,000 men. It is of absolute importance that I know whether the attack on you is serious or is it just a diversion to fool us. In these hours, Bonaparte believed that the enemy's main strike should be expected from the east against Ashro's troops. However, on the evening of January 13th, finally, new news arrived from Joubert. The attacks, on which he informed earlier, grew into a massive assault. He was outflanked by superior forces and had to retreat to Rivoli to avoid being surrounded. Joubert's report did not leave any doubts in Bonaparte's mind about Alvinci's plan. It became clear that the Austrians were attacking from several directions, but they planned to make the main strike on the north. The enemy defined the movement. All their soldiers are heading toward Rivoli. Bonaparte immediately reacted. Having ordered Joubert to hold on as long as possible, he promptly galloped to Rivoli. The divisions of Massena and Ray, as well as Victor's reserves, also headed there. Verona's defense was only given to a small garrison. Ajro opposed General Provera's corps. Bonaparte arrived at Rivoli on the night of January 14th. The moon shone brightly. I ascended several heights and observed the lines of the enemy's fires, which filled the whole country between the Adige and Lake Garda and reddened the atmosphere. I clearly distinguished five camps, each composed of a column which had commenced their movements the preceding day. Alvinci split his army into many columns. Three central columns had to attack the northern part of the Rivoli Plateau. Two more columns had to outflank the French. At this time, 7,000 soldiers commanded by Kwasdanovich, supported by cavalry and artillery, had to move along the Adige River in the gorge to make a decisive strike. Thus, by maneuvering on a vast area of land, the Austrians' columns had to surround the French completely. Alvinci was not aware that Bonaparte arrived at Rivoli at night, therefore he planned to start the battle around 10 a.m. when all the columns gathered at the battlefield. The main disadvantage of Alvinci's plan was the hard coordination of six attacking columns which were moving along the snaking and narrow mountain roads, and unfortunately for Alvinci, Bonaparte immediately understood this. In this position, he decided to hold the Rivoli Plateau and slow the movement of Kwasdanovich to the gorge no matter what, preventing his exit to the plateau. For this, it was extremely important to seize and hold the Chapel of San Marco, which towered above the gorge. By blocking the entrance to the gorge in this manner, Bonaparte wanted to concentrate all his power on the central columns and crush them before the rest of the columns got to the battlefield. He had to act urgently, or otherwise all the Austrians' columns would complete their maneuvers and surround the French. At this moment, Bonaparte had about 10,000 soldiers, 12 cannons, and several regiments of cavalry. The rest of the divisions were hurrying in the forced march to Rivoli. So, not waiting for reinforcements, the commander-in-chief ordered an attack. At 4 a.m., Joubert's division moved ahead with decisiveness. In less than 30 minutes, the French half-brigade, led by Brigadier General Vial, seized the chapel of San Marco and all the agendant heights in the assault. Thus, they effectively blocked the passage through the gorge. The rest of the troops took their positions on the heights of the Rivoli Plateau. Such an early attack from the French was a complete surprise for Alvinci because he didn't know about Bonaparte's arrival and thought he only dealt with one of the French divisions. Nevertheless, Alvinci very quickly put his army on alert, and at 6 a.m., three central Austrian columns descended from the mountains to attack the French on the plateau. 
Thus, Bonaparte reached a very important goal. With a decisive morning attack, he forced Alvinci to start battle before his other columns arrived. Meanwhile, in the Rivoli Plateau's center, an intense battle between three columns that had 12,000 men led by Alvinci and 8,000 men in the division of Joubert started. Narrow passages to the chapel of San Marco made the Austrians' attacks on Joubert's right flank division harder. However, on the Rivoli Plateau, the French position was difficult. Seeing that they outnumbered the enemy, the Austrian battalions were attacking very fiercely. During another attack, several Austrian battalions outflanked the French positions and made an attack on the 29th Half Brigade. Simultaneously with the flank attack, the Austrians increased the attack power on the front. Eventually, the 29th Half Brigade subdued to the pressure and started to retreat chaotically. The 85th Half Brigade standing nearby, seeing this, also started to panic and left its positions in the center. The entire center of the French shook. Bonaparte didn't have the necessary reserves at this moment to correct the position. However, at this very critical moment, Massena arrived at the battlefield. This brave general informed the others that his division would arrive any minute. This news encouraged the soldiers and prevented them from panicking. Finally, around 10 a.m., the 32nd Half Brigade appeared on the battlefield. It was followed by the 75th Half Brigade. Bonaparte immediately sent reinforcements to the center to help Joubert. What fine troops were the 32nd and the 75th? It was the first time that I had seen any of Massena's army corps marching to meet the enemy. There was something so firm, so formidable in their bearing that one felt that marching to battle with them was marching to victory. It is needless to say that the column composed of three Austrian battalions was overthrown and put to flight that it lost 100 prisoners of war in addition to killed and wounded. Thus, thanks to a very timely arrival of reinforcements, Bonaparte managed to regain the lost positions in the center and again push the enemy's infantry to the foothill. At this time, the Austrian columns that were outflanking the French started to approach the battlefield. Despite that, Bonaparte was persistently striking the center of the enemy, not paying much attention to the flank menace. However, the position grew more threatening. On the left flank, Lusignan's column was approaching Offi. On the right flank, Lukasevich already reached Cheraino's neighborhood and started firing cannons on the 39th Half Brigade sent to protect the gorge. Additionally, Kwasdanovich's troops started to attack the French infantry at the gorge's exit. As a result, Joubert's infantry, which was attacked from three directions, was forced to leave their positions on the right flank. The Austrian infantry in the center watched the exit of Kwasdanovich's troops from the gorge and applauded, thinking they were victorious. Obviously, for the French, it was a critical moment in the battle. However, Bonaparte, amid the turmoil and rumbling of the battle, kept a cool head. Through perfect tactical intuition, he concluded that the central columns of the enemy were now exhausted and did not have the necessary attacking potential. Based on this conclusion, Bonaparte chose to regroup his troops in the center and make a concentrated attack against Kwasdanovich's troops emerging from the gorge. Following Bonaparte's order, General Joubert immediately regrouped his brigades against the threat on the eastern sector. Additionally, all the available artillery was formed in one battery and put to face the gorge. Thus, as soon as the vanguard of Kwasdanovich's column emerged from the gorge on the Rivoli Plateau, Joubert's infantry attacked them in the front. At the same time, the French artillery started shooting point-blank at the enemy's tight. This devastating firepower struck first on the advancing Austrian cavalry dragoons who broke and stampeded through their own infantry causing mass chaos. Moreover, thanks to the precise French hit, two Austrian carts of ammunition exploded which caused immense losses. In the minute of complete confusion, Bonaparte threw all his cavalry to attack led by Leclerc and La Salle. Sabre à la main and in a matter of seconds, close cavalry squadrons hit the Austrians at full speed and completely scattered their rows. 
In a short time, the vanguard of Kwasdanovich's column was thrown back to the gorge and crushed. The rest of the troops haphazardly retreated back along the gorge. La Salle's cavalry attack was a complete success. Thus, Bonaparte successfully overcame the battle's decisive crisis. His enemy's center was crushed, and now the French could deal with the flank columns. Meanwhile, Colonel Lusignan, not being informed about the defeat of Alvinci, kept going further and further to the rear of the French army. However, pretty soon, the last of Bonaparte's reserve showed itself from the rear. It was General Ray's division. The Austrians tried to oppose it, but in vain. Eventually, in less than an hour, the 5,000 large Austrian corps were fully crushed. Only the corps' commander, with a handful of officers, managed to escape. By 5 p.m., the victory was nearly secured. However, Bonaparte didn't have time to rest. After noon, the message arrived that Provera's corps crossed the Adige River and was approaching Mantua. In this situation, Bonaparte, having made sure that his enemy was retreating, passed the command of the troops to Joubert and rushed south with General Massena's heroic brigades to prevent the Austrians from getting close to Mantua. Joubert acquired a heavy responsibility because Alvinci decided to continue the battle. The second phase of the Battle of Rivoli was on January 15th, and Joubert completely met Bonaparte's expectations. Personally, heading the frontal attack, he completely crushed the leftovers of Alvinci columns. In the meantime, General Provera, using the spreading out of Ushro's division, broke through to the neighborhoods of Mantua. However, the passages to the fortress were securely blocked by Serurier's soldiers, and despite all of Provera's efforts, he wasn't able to break through to the fortress that day. A decisive assault was planned by the Austrians on January 16th. At dawn the next day, Wormser tried to make another sortie out of the fortress to try to unite with Provera's troops, but at this moment, Bonaparte appeared in the Austrian rear guard together with Massena's division. As a result, all of the Austrian attacks were repulsed, and Provera's corps turned out to be in an absolutely hopeless position. After short negotiations, Provera was forced to surrender to the French together with his 6,000 soldiers. Again, the French demonstrated exceptional endurance. For 120 hours, Massena's soldiers took part in three battles and walked 54 miles. This required amazing valor, and the division's commander undoubtedly earned his future title of Duke of Rivoli. The defeat of Alvinci's army meant the undoubtful capitulation of Mantua. Without any hope of help, Wormser was able to hold this fortress until the end of the month, but on February 2nd, 1797, this large fortress finally fell into French hands. Bonaparte, by rights, gave the honor of accepting capitulation to General Serurier and acknowledging Wormser's bravery allowed him to exit the fortress as a free man with all military honors. In this way, Bonaparte was able to reach unheard of before results. Over five days of battles and maneuvers, only 13,000 fleeing soldiers were left from the 48,000 strong Alvinci's army. Additionally, the French finally seized the Mantua fortress, capturing 16,000 of Wormser's soldiers as POWs with 500 cannons and 60 banners. It was a complete defeat of the Austrian army. When he greeted his soldiers with another victory, Bonaparte told them, The Roman legions walked 24 miles a day. You can walk 30 miles a day and fight instead of rest. The victory in the Battle of Rivoli and Mantua's capitulation finally decided Italy's fate. However, Bonaparte didn't want to stop there. Now he was very soon going to strike the very heart of his enemy. Vienna was overcome with panic. 